Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where you go through the Bible chapter by chapter <laughs> and get your whole Bible back. We are having our second, third cup of coffee? I think our third. This morning? <laughs> we had a big day yesterday with Papa's birthday and company over oh, last night. It was beautiful. Tell them about those it. Those of you that are listening that were at the little birthday soiree, <laughs> I, I just lovely. can't thank you enough. That was the only birthday party that I can remember. Ever having. And it was the biggest birthday party that I can remember. Never have I been treated so well. And it was just wonderful to ha have our core, our friends and supporters Man. here at the house. Let me say something really fun. He, yesterday afternoon, we've been really being squeezed in our house with the stuff that God's blessed us with and the staff now. And we've been kind of feeling uh, it's bulging at the seams. It's a very small three bedroom that God gave us and we don't plan on giving it up. But we went to look for a five bedroom yesterday for fun, you know, defining our tastes because we are people of vision. And um, we went, it's funny that we looked yesterday afternoon, just real quick, Russ and I. And um, last night, the patio where we had, a, we have an outdoor screened in porch and we had just enough seats for the 20, 22 people, just enough chairs to go around that patio and then a big table spread with a taco supper. And um, it was so fun because I told Russ before we fell asleep, I said, do you remember you told me one time we'll start out, we started in a breakfast room with the meeting, and when we outgrow it, you said we'll rent another building. So we did that, our prayer meeting uh, uh, outgrew itself within a couple weeks when the folks moved in from six different states. So we rented a building over at Point Royale. And then he said the same about the house. If we have a group and we start outgrowing the group, it'll be time to look for another place. Isn't that prophetic? We went ahead and did it before we realized, look at this, we're at capacity. So we're just kind of excited about the future and God's gonna, this is such a lovely blessing, this home. We feel like he's gonna keep it in the ministry. He's gonna keep it in the family, so to speak. And we'll be able to use it for people to have a, a respite, a place to enjoy themselves sitting here on the lake. And the ironic thing is that when we first got this house two years ago, uh, it was on my birthday. Mm -hmm. And yesterday was my birthday without any planning. Here we are out looking at houses again. We had forgotten that completely, but we believe in the timing of God. And I feel your excitement, guys. I know you're with us because we're with the Father and the Father's with us. And the sentiments that I heard last night around that room, I asked everybody to bring a blessing of words to Russ and they brought gifts but um, I know that those are the same sentiments that are shared around the globe and for those of you who haven't been with us yet in person you will be because God will see to it and we just want to say thank you for all the sentiments and Russ did a thank you as well online today so praise God so today second Kings chapter 7 why sit we here till we die in this chapter, the city of Samaria is besieged and four lepers stand without the gates, starving to death. They decide they cannot sit by waiting to die. <laughs> they make a move and God moves with them and the entire city is delivered. God wants us to make decisions in anticipation of his faithfulness. These lepers exemplify for us the chaos decision God will call upon us at times to make that will bring about your miracle. Now, Kitty just darted outside because the puppies are outside and got a hold of one of the birthday balloons and popped it, pounced on it, popped it, and she dashed out there to keep them from swallowing the balloons. So she's coming back in now. <laughs> And it's a short chapter uh, today, only 20 uh, verses. And uh, I'll give Kitty a chance. Give me a second to log in. Oh, it didn't <laughs> like my login. I'm trying to hurry. You can do it. It's a beautiful day today. The fog's rolled in. It wasn't as uh, foggy this morning 
as it is uh, right now. It's gorgeous. And uh, I intended to get my camera out and take some pictures. We've taken some lovely pictures of uh, the mornings out here overlooking uh, the lake. And we'll begin by reading the first, just the first two verses. Okay. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. When a Lord on, those, on whose hands the king leaned, then a Lord on whose hands the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. Wow. So in the previous chapter, the Syrians besiege Samaria, and the people are starving to the point that they're resorting to desperate measures to survive. Now, the backstory to this siege is just prior to that, there was a season in time when the Syrians kept coming down trying to ambush the king of Israel, who the northern, this is not the king out of Judah, this is the king who ruled in Samaria over the northern tribes. And every time the king of Syria would set an ambush for him, Elisha would send word to the king of Israel and say, don't go there. And he thought that he had a spy <laughs> in the camp. And one of his, one of the king of Syria's men said, no, uh, Elisha the prophet knows what you, he knows the pillow talk between you and your wife. He Come knows everything now. that's going on. Amen. And he was trying to capture Elisha. And he sent an army down to get Elisha. And that's the famous story where the servant was afraid and Elisha said, Lord opened his eyes and he saw the armies Amen. of angels that were surrounding them. And uh, then the, uh, the army of Syria came to Dothan to capture Elisha. Knowing where a prophet is is one thing, capturing him is another. <laughs> and, and God blinded the army so that they didn't know it was Elisha. And he said, I know who you're looking for. Come on, I'll take you to him. And not only blinded them that he was Elisha, but blinded them as to the geography because he took them right into the city of Samaria that they were planning on besieging right in the city walls. And God opened their eyes. And here this entire army is being held captive. And the king of Israel says, Elisha, should we, should we kill him? He said, no, don't kill him, feed him. Mm -hmm. And so it said they made a great feast. They prepared a great wow. feast and fed them and sent them back home to Syria. Now, can the, I say real quick, we have a friend who has a grown son, struggled a bit, a lot. And uh, when she prayed this one, one morning, what am I going to do about so-and-so? And the father said, feed him. Just feed him. And she's been faithful to just feed him. And you see, why would Elisha always remember that Jesus re read these passages? And when Jesus said, uh, be kind to your enemy, love your enemy, do good to your enemy, he was saying so from a position of strength, not a position of weakness. Mm -hmm. The point being, why was Elisha being kind to this army? Because he could see the angels surrounding. In other words, I've got you surrounded. Let me be nice to you. Yeah, because <laughs> he, he was being kind. We're not kind as pacifists. We're going to let somebody plow us under because we're Christians. No, we know that we love from a position of strength. He was not loving that army. It was not like saying, let's be nice to him. Maybe they won't hurt us. Uh -uh. That was not what he was doing. He His attitude was, we got him surrounded. Let's give him a meal and send him home, realizing that what was going to happen is this army was going to go to Syria, turn around and come right back and besiege this city to the point that they were boiling their children for food. Jesus. And the king of Israel Jesus. got so angry, he said, I'm going to take Elisha's head off of his shoulders. Mm. He was mad because so now the king of Syria and the king of Israel are in agreement on this one thing. They both didn't like Elisha and wanted him dead. Oh so when you move in the prophetic and you're doing what God said, I, we've been in situations where we were in one particular circumstance that God sent us up north uh, to uh, uh, two friends of ours who were living on farms adjacent from one another. 
and they were carrying sidearms. They were so mad at each other that they were carrying sidearms ready to kill each other. Christians. Yeah, Christian, Hello. Christian brothers. And uh, when I when we drove up, I saw the angel of the Lord standing in the gravel road between these two farms directly across the street from one another. And uh, the first one we went to, well, whose side are you on? I said, I'm not on anybody's side. I said, I'm on the side of that angel that's standing right out there in that gravel road. He's the one that Joshua dealt with when Joshua said, whose side are you, are you on? He said, I'm on the Lord's side. Come on now. Come on now. <laughs> and so, and when you're on the Lord's side, those who want you to take a side aren't too happy about that because they want to control you. They want you, they don't want you to be responding to God. They want you to be responding to them. And so here, uh, the king had encountered this woman who had resorted to cannibalism. And so in anger, uh, the king of uh, Israel vows to execute Elisha. Elisha, however, had nothing to do with bringing the siege, other than arranging for the release of the Syrian army that had previously been held captive in the city of Samaria. In the last verse of chapter 6, the king claims that this evil proceeded from the Lord. He decides he's going to blame it on God. Uh, proceeded from the Lord, and don't we do that? Why God? Why did God let this happen? Isn't that something we commonly uh, do? We take credit for the good things that happen. You know, people, the, the same people that will say, why did God? Why did God let that happen? So why does God let little children die? But they never turn around and say, uh, "Thank God for the promotion I got uh, at work." And if you suggest they should thank God, they'll scoff in your face and say, "Why should I thank God? I got that for myself." Mm -hmm. We had anything negative that happens, they're not going to take responsibility for it. They're going to blame it on God, the insurance companies. It's an act of God. No, it's not. Uh, <laughs> But there's no indication of this. However, now Elisha is being threatened with execution. But he listen to the word of the Lord he gives. Notice he's not reacting. Here they're wanting to kill him. And he says, hey, relax. You're going to be eating a meal within 24 hours. And so he didn't respond. How many times? Kitty and I have had very uh, powerful men. Uh, powerful, yes. Self-important, even more so that have uh, mocked us, that have uh, said all manner of evil against us. We were invited to a conference uh, in uh, Arizona. Uh, we were given to understand we were going to be the keynote speakers, and we got there, and there were two speakers that got up before us, and those two speakers that got up before us repudiated the prophetic in no uncertain terms. And the host just sat back and let that happen. And I just pat <laughs> Russ on his little leg. Yes, Kitty table. sees my face turning those colors. You know, <laughs> I, I don't do a very good job at, at, with my poker face. It's okay. And, and I'm asking God, what are we supposed to do about this? And we wound, and when it came time for us to speak, the, set, the Lord said, the first thing I want you to do is main vein those two unbelieving so-called apostles. Plain main vein, and, uh, for those that don't know. Uh, well, uh, main veining is when you go straight for the heart of who God says they are and where they've been and what they've done and what they're going to do. That's what we call in the prophetic main veining somebody. So there was no denying it was and God. We, we usually use that term along with another theological term called prophesying their socks off. Yeah, that too. And so much so that one of them actually calls us about every every uh -huh. several months. Will about call every us six up. months for a continuing word. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Elisha's doing. Here they want to kill him. He says, relax, and he prophesies that you're going to be eating, you're going to have a meal within 24 hours. And one of the king's uh, retinue, one of his helpers, says, what, God's going to put windows in heaven? Don't you see that Syrian army out there? And Elisha says, you're going to see the word of the Lord come to pass, but you're not going to partake of it. No, you don't get any steak. <laughs> <laughs> See, in Paul's, do you see how positive that is? And do you see the problem with the man who's despising the word of the, the word of the Lord? First Thessalonians 5:20 says, despise not prophesying. Amen. This is the first century church in its pristine, most spiritual uh, characteristics. It, it, this is the high watermark of the purposes of God uh, in human history. 
Uh, but yet they had an attitude of despising prophecies. I get that. Let me tell you something. I've, I've, I've taken prophecies. I've probably thrown away more than I kept. <laughs> and not because they weren't of God. Sometimes you get tired. I, I remember making the statement, I'm tired of hearing uh, people tell me what a great ministry I'm going to have. I got sick and tired of it. I despised the prophetic. I was wore out because I'd get the prophetic word that I was trying to bring it to pass. Yeah. And I but he has repented. <laughs> and I couldn't make it come to pass. Right. And so I got mad and I despised prophesying. <laughs> and the Lord heard it and said, I know how to do it, that boy. I'll make him I'll a prophet. I'll just make him a prophet, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> See, from the beginning of time, prophets have come under assault from skeptics and unbelievers. But it's interesting in 1 Thessalonians 5, the very next verse, listen to what it says. And, and again, I want you to see the positive uh, character of Elisha's prophecy, Elijah, Samuel, how we, we tend to see all this doom and gloom, hurling, lightning bolts, but whenever somebody had a problem, I lost a tool my neighbor loaned me. It's in the Jordan River. I'll make that axe head float. We fixed up, a, we made a gumbo and put some poison mushrooms in there. Well, let me fix that for you. Uh, I'm uh, just fixing my last meal for me and my boy. We're going to die. Well, let me take care of that for you. They're selling my sons into slavery, one widow said. He said, I'll take care of that for you. And uh, the prophets were all about the fivefold, I mean, the Gifts of the Spirit, it says they were given to profit withal. You know, where do we get the idea that we have to be non-profit? The whole concept of non-profit is, a, is a, a rooted in the vow of poverty that, right. that was taken in the Middle Ages. It started out as a vow of humility, became a vow of poverty. And uh, tell that. You got to break the curse. And of you the have vow to of break poverty. the curse of the vow of poverty. Maybe we weren't a part of the. It wasn't just the Catholic Church. You need to understand. It was the medieval church. It was what the church was. It was that take took this vow. And you and I, our our uh, cultural heritage, the cultural church came out of that church. Vows are made by words. They're broken by words. You have to break the curse of the vow of poverty. Uh, and the very next verse, despise not prophesying. Okay, what does that mean to despise not prophesying? How do you do that? Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, the very next verse tells us, prove all things. Oh, that's right. You prove that word. And if I like it, then it's proven. If I don't like it, it's no. He tells us how to prove the word. Proving the word is not uh, uh, assaulting the integrity of a prophet because he gave you a provisional and conditional word which you promptly put on the shelf and did not pursue any of the things that God said. And then when it doesn't come to pass, you, you make a decision, well, that word wasn't of God. Every prophecy is conditional and provisional. It's like one guy said, do you judge the rebellious spirit of the prophet or do you judge the prophet by the rebellious spirit of the people? And he said, but he says, prove all things. How do you prove all things? Hold fast to that which is good. Do you see that concept of the goodness, the profitability? Believe as prophets, so shall you prosper. Prosperity is always connected with the prophetic. Blessing is always connected with the prophetic. Prove all things. How do you prove a prophecy? You hold fast. Is it a good prophecy? Hang on to it. Amen. Is it some doom and gloomer, somebody with a unibrow, uh, uh, hurling lightning bolts and stroking his chin and figuring out how he's going to put you under condemnation and make you feel insecure? You go. can toss that prophetic word away. Is he somebody who delights to step on toes like the prophets I've seen strutting around? We deal with things. <laughs> Uh, in our day, prophecies about doom and gloom tend to be more quickly validated than a positive word. In fact, we kind of question the positive word sometimes. <laughs> That's a pillow prophet. Oh, <laughs> we often receive a word of promise and deliverance, and we are hesitant to believe it because it's a good report. How do you prove a prophetic word? The next phrase tells you, hold fast to that which is good, because that is the character of of New Testament prophecy. Is the word a good word? Then accept it. Is it a negative word? Then reject it. Amen. And I don't care who gives it to you. It's pretty basic. We have had 
prophets with national, nationally recognized, very well-known names. Mm -hmm. Give a negative, contaminated word, and they hand it to us on a CD, like we're going to cherish it forever, and it just made a nice Frisbee on the way home. And let, let me just teach you a little bit how that happens. They got a contaminated word from somebody in leadership before the meeting started, and a little whisper and mutter in an ear, and it turned their words south. It went wrong. It went bad because they were listening to gossip from the platform in their ear. That's, That's how it happened. Right. So hold fast to that which is good. The word good here, how, what is a good word? See, the old, despise not prophesying, how do you do that? By proving the word, how do you prove the word? By determining is it good or is it evil? The word good there means this, agreeable. Mm -hmm. You ever seen a disagreeable prophet? <laughs> I have. Yep. Okay, you reject that prophet. You reject that prophecy. I realize they, they get this strutting little Napoleon attitude, I'm a prophet. And they think the anointing is to be disagreeable. But the very qualification of the word you accept is that it's a good word. It's an agreeable word. It's excellent, beautiful, precious, and praiseworthy. And if that's not the character of the word, then we need to reject it. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians 1.20. He said, for all of the promises in him, are you in him? Mm -hmm. If you're not, I have a decision card that I'd like you to sign, and we'll get you <laughs> baptized in the bathtub back here down well, the hall. Again. You need to give your life to Jesus. <laughs> are you in him? All the promises of God in him are yes. That's right. That means God's default answer to you is yes. Okay. And amen. So be it. Unto the glory of God by us. See, it wasn't that way under the old covenant. They would come to Jesus and say, uh, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And then they waited to see what he would say. And he would say, I will be thou made whole. Mm -hmm. See, he made a specific decision on each case. But for you and I, he has given you and I the yea and amen. Mm -hmm. For all of his promises. God, are you going to keep your promise? Every one of them. Uh, let me get back to you. I, I'm on the phone. Uh, let me get back to you, uh, and I'll let you know. No, it's a blanket yes. You have a blanket yes, folks. That's right. A blanket yes. A blanket amen. <laughs> all of the promises, all of them, healing, provision. What? What? What's the promise? See? Uh, can you take yes for an answer? Will God keep his promises? Yes. Theologians, however, maintain that while God makes certain promises, it doesn't mean he will keep his promise. And they say this is about God's sovereignty. And they say God will not be limited to his own word. That's despicable. Religion would rather indict the character of God than point to the problem of unbelief in the hearts of men. Mm -hmm. In Luke 9.55, the disciples wanted to call down fire on the city of Samaria. But Jesus rebuked them and uh, told them they were operating in an old covenant paradigm of judgment rather than a new covenant paradigm of blessing. And in doing this, you need to understand, Jesus reconfigured the prophetic. All of those remarks throughout the Gospels where Jesus said, you've heard it said in old time, this and that, but I That's say it. to you, the such and such. What was he doing? He was reconfiguring the economy of God. Thank you, Father. So he's reconfiguring the prophetic, and he made the statement along this line. He said, you're thinking Old Covenant prophetic, but I'm reconfiguring the prophetic because I did not come to destroy, but to save. Did Jesus have authority to do that? Did Jesus have authority to reconfigure the prophetic? Because Revelations 19.10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. But the, the testimony of much of the prophetic today is that of Elijah calling down fire. And even Elijah didn't do that all the time. But it's about calling down fire on the prophets of Baal and negativity and renunciation and denunciation. But uh, we, the spirit of prophecy in the new covenant is not testifying to the Elijah paradigm, but testifying to the character of Christ. And I'll give you another scripture to back it up. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, God, who in sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, mm -hmm. hath in these days, so here it is, it's a, this is the way it was done then, but now it's changed. Mm -hmm. Jesus reconfigured the economy of God. 
he says, hath in these days spoken unto us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom he made the worlds. So do you see what he's saying? That he, the, the old covenant paradigm had one characteristic. The new covenant paradigm has the character of Christ. If you look at the purposes of God through the lens of the Old Testament prophets, then you can certainly have a precedent for destruction, judgment, and death. And the prophets love to get in the pulpit and tell the stories about the people that died yes. and the ones that they, they did this and negative things happened and they and people like, oh, we get get this this you know, they put their mojo on us and we and we get all wrapped up in that it's just and we think that's God. That's all it is. Uh, but in this passage in Hebrews we see that is not legitimate. God in time past spoke by the prophets, but now is speaking through his son. How? The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Amen. Through new covenant prophets, a new covenant paradigm. Did Jesus ever call down destruction or death on anyone? No, he told the thief, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Yes, every time he opened his mouth, <laughs> oh, it was about goodness. blessing. Oh, my goodness. Did he not say, John 10, 10, he said, I come that you might, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Mm -hmm. I came that you might have life. life. That more abundant. And again, Revelations 19, 10, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. You have to make up your mind. Are you going to accept the prophetic as moving in the character of Christ, or do you demand an old covenant paradigm of destruction and death? And you know this when you keep hearing the preachers every time. We were in a meeting just the other day talking about revival. Here we come, Ananias and Sapphira. If you can't raise them from the dead, quit boasting about the ones you're killing. And no, why would you do that anyway? Are you volunteering? No. Everybody gives a standing ovation. Yes, the days of Ananias and Sapphira. And I'm thinking, are you volunteering? My goodness. No, but I know somebody I would volunteer. That's not love. And that's not life more abundant either. And so here, Elisha, they're, they're wanting to kill him. And he's saying, relax, fellas, you're going to be eating tomorrow. Except for the guy that mocked. Oops. He's so, on a fast. <laughs> so read verses 3 through 7. And there were four leprous men at the uh, entering of the gate. And they said to one another, why sit here till we die? If we say we will enter the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit still here we die also now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the syrians if they save us alive we shall live and if they kill us we shall but die and they rose up in the twilight to go out unto the camp of the syrians and when they were coming to the uttermost part of the camp of the of syria behold there was no man there and the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said to one another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. <laughs> you see, these men were not moving in self-confidence. Mm -hmm. They were moving in God-confidence. Their confidence was in God. They were casting their lot. They were seeking an expression of God's mercy. Uh, outside the city walls now of Samaria, here, there's the four lepers. And they were doubly rejected. The army outside the walls wants to kill them, and the people inside the walls rejected them. You ever run into that? The world hates you, and you can't find any place in the church. The church doesn't want to see you uh, either. <clears throat> we've seen many people that have come out of an LGBT yes, lifestyle. Exactly. And we've counseled them powerful men and women of God mm -hmm. who have had transformation in their lives, and the church hates them, and the Jesus. world hates them. They're no more accepted in the church because they, they have a testimony of where they came from and the church doesn't want anything to do with them. We love them. They come and but visit we love us. Them. Hey, you better believe it. <laughs> Amen. Notice that they decided not to simply sit idly by waiting for death to claim them. Right. They were going to do something. I've said that many times. I'm going to do something if I do it wrong. Why? Because God makes even my mistakes to prosper. And about <laughs> um, he can deal with anything except for they your... Made, that's right. They made a decision. Except for your inability. God can deal with anything except a refusal to make a decision. Amen. <laughs> How did, where did you get that, Brother Walden? Somebody said it to me years ago as a young pastor. Mm -hmm. God can deal with anything except for your refusal to make a decision. 
In Luke 17, 20, Jesus said, the kingdom of God comes not with observation. In other words, you have to do something. What you do with what God has already said to you is much more powerful than what you're waiting upon him to do Amen. or to say. Amen. Let me say that again. What you do with what God has already said to you is much more powerful than what you're waiting on him to do Amen. or to say. Amen. You must act. If you will act, then you give God something to work with and deliverance will come. That's what we call making a chaos decision. Amen. Why say we here till we die? Let's do something. Okay. Things are the way they are because of what you are doing. If you want something different, you must do something different. This was the choice of the four lepers. They decided to go forward toward the enemy's camp, and when they did, God made their feet sound like an approaching army, and they fled. Let me give you an example out of my own life. I, was, uh, I went into business. God told me to go to Windsor, Missouri, open a business. I went, opened a business, and within about six weeks of opening that business, I was out of money. Uh, I had, I was, my my business was right next door to City Hall, Main Street, Windsor, Missouri. People were walking by and nobody was coming in my door. And I felt like I was in a car traveling 60 miles an hour, about 10 feet from a brick wall. I was about to hit the wall. It was all going to be over and I was going to be in big, big trouble. And uh, God gave me this verse. Why sit we here till we die? And so I took uh, what little money I had and I gave all of it into the church that I was part of at, at the time. I said, uh, I'm going to cast myself on the mercy of God. I'm going to believe in what God, uh, that God's going to come through for me. And I made a chaos decision. And uh, notice that, I, you know, if so, well, I don't have any money, I'll give God of my time. No, if you want a breakthrough, you have to yield up to God render to God in the very area where you need breakthrough through the most. Because a seed produces after its own kind. You don't sow Afghans and hope to get hundreds of dollars. You sow dollars for dollars. You sow corn for corn. It's the same principle. So here I was. I had hundreds of dollars of utility bills due, hundreds of dollars of advertising budget due. I had rent on the building to pay. I had all of these debts associated with the business within a few days of demanding to be paid. And I had no money in the bank. And I took the money that I had and I gave it into the gospel. I said, it's like David. They asked him, do you want to fall into the hand of man or the hand of God? Let me fall into the hand of God. And I gave it into the gospel, and guess what? Six weeks later, <laughs> I had $16,000 in my checking account. I hired four employees, opened a second location, and that was just the beginning of newfound fruitfulness in my life. Amen. Can I share an example when it happened to me? When I had the restaurant, God gave me in Seymour, Missouri. I had it eight years. And um, at this one point, there was a little crisis of finances weren't coming in, and they weren't flowing again. And I had great vision for this huge chain of restaurants, but what do you do with the nasty here and now, you know, when the people were not turning in by the, by the dozens and dozens a day to the restaurant right on a highway? And so I went home, cried out to the Lord and said, I don't understand. I know you don't have a problem, but tell me what is amiss here because it should be, there should be a flow. And he told me that 95% faith doesn't cut it with him. That I had to dial in and get 100% all faith, no fear. No fear. You can't. Uh, fear cancels out faith. So I said, sir, and I was just a crying and a bawling and a squalling, you know. I repented. And so instantly in the spirit, I see God take his hand and dip it in the blood of Jesus. And he made a cross on the top of my building, which was an oblong, very small restaurant. And I, he made a cross and he said to me, Kitty, now, now the oil of the spirit will begin to drip in a much greater measure. And I thanked him, and I praised him, and I got back in the car, went back to work. I had another uh, server taking my place for a little while. And I get to the store, and I hadn't been there five minutes, and a man, a Baptist man from across town said, Miss Kitty, we were just wondering, some of the men would like to have a prayer breakfast. Are you doing anything with that back room in your restaurant? And I wasn't. It was a TV room for my son. 
And I said, no, sir, I'm not. He said, well, we'd like to pay to carpet it and bring in some tables and chairs. And we'd like to have a men's prayer breakfast. He didn't say men's. He said, we'd like to have a monthly prayer breakfast. Would that be okay with you? And I cried so hard, I couldn't catch my breath. And I said, Mr. Pennington, I'll be right over. I got to tell you what happened to me a little while ago. And it was the most glorious thing God did. Cry out to him. He's the only one who can answer. But if I wasn't asking the question, I wouldn't have got the answer. You've got to ask him. Many times we feel in prayer that we have to cajole and talk God into acting in your behalf. And you can see by this account, these, these men were not, we're going to be God's men of faith and power. No, they, they were desperate. <laughs> and they were just going to do something. God's looking for somebody to do something. We think that mental believing makes God act, but it doesn't. Their action predicated what God did next. You have to move toward into, this is what I mean by pushing into the pressure. People yeah. don't get that. Yeah. Acts 14, 22, through much pressure or tribulation, you enter the kingdom. You have to move into the pressure like these lepers did. Move. I did that by emptying my bank account. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This is not where I ask for your credit card. No, no. People that question that, I tell people, they complain, oh, you're just after my money. I said, you need to go out and empty your bank account and give to the poorest, most undeserving people, person you know. Amen. That's That will be the beginning of God helping that person. Uh, uh, you can see by this account, God is waiting on the merest hint of putting the situation in his hands and he will act. The story here portrays God exactly the opposite of the way modern Christianity presumes in regarding answered prayer. We get this picture of an austere God sitting on a distant throne, mm -hmm. stroking his beard, <laughs> deciding whether or not he's going to make good on his own word. Mm -hmm. uh, Second Chronicles 16.9 says this, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro Amen. throughout the whole earth Amen. to show himself strong, in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Here, and then he goes on. You do not have to overcome God's reluctance to move in your behalf because he doesn't have any. Uh, Jesus, the death of the cross, is God's statement of intent. This is my intent. This is how much I want to be in your life. If he withheld not, Romans 8 says, his only son, are you telling me he's going to hold back some lesser gift? Is he telling you telling me he's going to hold back your financial breakthrough or the relationship miracle that you're in need of? Is that what we're saying? That he, yes, he gave his only begotten son, but we're having trouble believing him for the rent, for the electric bill, for some other. Trust thing. him to go to heaven, but you can't believe him for the house <laughs> payment. <laughs> See, if prayers go unanswered, it is not because God capriciously chooses not to come through for you. But understand this, it is not asking is involved, but it's not enough to ask. There must be corresponding action. Faith that that works is dead. We wait for God to answer before we act, and consequently nothing happens. You must act. Amen. You must pray and you must act. And you must act in anticipation of an answer as the four lepers did. And if you're not willing to act, nothing happens. I'm waiting on God. You don't, you don't understand. That's not what waiting on God means. Mm -mm. You ask and then you act in anticipation of his, his promise coming to pass in your life. Uh, verse 8 through uh, the end of the chapter. Yeah, we're not waiting on God. He's waiting on us, guys. 8 through the end. And when those, these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and did drink and did carry thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered another tent carried thence also and went in and hid it then they said to one another we do not well this day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace if we tarry till morning some mischief will come upon us now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household so they came and called <clears throat> to the porter of the city, and they told him, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied, asses tied, and the tents were as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's household wherewith. And the king arose in the night and said unto his servants, I will now show you what the Syrians have done to us. 
they know that we be hungry therefore they are gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field saying when they come out of the city we'll catch them alive and get into the city and one of the servants answered and said let some take i pray thee five of the horses that remain which are left in the city behold uh, they are as all the multitude of israel that are left in it behold i say they are even as all the multitudes of the israelites that are consumed and let us send and see they took therefore two chariots and, and the king sent after the host of the syrians saying go and see and they went after them unto Jordan, and lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels which the Syrians had cast away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king. And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. And the king appointed uh, the Lord on those he whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate and the people trod upon him in the gate and he died as the man of god had said who spake when the king came down and it came to pass as the man of god had spoken to the king saying two measures of barley for a shekel a measure of fine flour for a shekel shall be tomorrow about this time in the gate of samaria and that and that lord answered the man of god and said now behold if the lord should make windows in heaven might such a thing be and he said behold thou shalt see it with thy eyes but shall not eat thereof and so it fell out unto him for the people trod upon him in the gate and he died notice that he was appointed to have charge of the gate again always remember jesus read these chapters remember what he said he said scribes pharisees you hypocrites you won't enter in at the gate and you won't let anybody else enter in. Why was he standing at the gate? Because he was trying to keep the people from taking the food. He was not out there trying to get the food to them. He was using the gate to keep the people from getting to the food. He's a perfect picture of those that disqualify you. You cannot be blessed of God unless you meet my benchmark. But yet you look at this just like uh, I grew up in uh, uh, Pentecost and there are and it wasn't in my house but I was familiar with those who didn't believe in television we don't believe in TV that's wrong you can't have a TV and be a part of this church but uh, you hang out in the pastor's home and happen to spy in his uh, closet where you slide the doors back there is a console television <laughs> that he can open those doors and watch in his bedroom because he's spiritual. He can have that, my, but the my, people my. can't have that. My, my. And this is the guy who got trod on. He got trampled because he was trying to keep the people from having that which God had provided. It's like the word that God gave me. There is a flood coming. The flood plain of God's bounty is coming. And those who have staked their uh, lives who've built their lives on the parameters of what they think God is going to do are going to get uh, flooded out as the streams of God go out to the desert and they're going to be people that have been banished to the deserts by the religious crowd they're going to have lakefront property yes God so be it so these four Ooh. lepers were not selfish with their blessing Galatians 5 6 tells us of course not the Galatians 5 6 tells us that faith works by love they had a heart you realize they've been rejected they've been locked out they've been thrown out of the city and let the army kill them and here all of a sudden they think it's not right those people yes they wanted to kill us but we want to bless them they had a heart for those that rejected them and shut them out of the city so you see here is the law of faith operating first of all the law of faith operates in the context of sowing and reaping but the law of sowing and reaping is superseded by the law of love. When the law of sowing and reaping doesn't seem to work for you, oh, you don't know, Brother Walden, I have planted and I have sown. Let me tell you something. The law of sowing and reaping is superseded by the law of love. And if you want to become a lord of your own harvest, you have to ascend into the law of love, and then you become a lord of your own harvest, mm -hmm. and you enter into the Amos 9.13 place where the plowman overtakes the reaper, and your seed sown will produce a harvest before they hit the ground. Amen. See, I've sown and I've done this, but yet you point at somebody and say they don't deserve God's blessing. No, See, no, no. so your lack of love short circuits the law of sowing and reaping that otherwise would work in your behalf. 
Understand this. These lepers would not deny the people in the city, the people who denied them protection, the people who shut them out of their gates. But yet they would not, the blessing that you deny others, your enemies, for instance, is the measurement of your own ability to receive from God. It's like the Lord told me one time, we had somebody who was uh, viscerally committed to our destruction. Viscerally committed to our destruction. I mean, we've had people, God's going to kill you, you're going to die, well, all of this kind of stuff. And uh, and this particular person, I, I couldn't. I couldn't step outside my front door without knowing was where we going to be confronted, where we going to be assaulted, where we're going to be in it. And for a year we lived like that and just under intense pressure. And I don't care how faith filled you are when you're living under that kind of pressure. It's not pleasant. And one day the Lord says, um, is it OK with you if I bless them out of your life? Yep. <laughs> and it took me a minute. <laughs> you know. I was shaving, you know, and I just kind of hesitated there for a minute. And I said, yes, Lord, that would be fine. And that person went on to receive a multi-million dollar financial settlement and got so preoccupied with that that they didn't have time to persecute little Russ Walden and, and right. Kitty Walden. That's right. And uh, so the blessing that you would deny others is the measurement. Well, they don't deserve it. Neither did you. That's right. Our righteousness is filthy rags. We're all disqualified. They're disqualified from God's blessing. And you're not? <laughs> We're not qualified. The blessing that you would deny others is the measurement of your own inability to receive from God. Many people know that they have faith to move mountains, but they don't realize that their lack of moving in the law of love denies them their miracle. Let me say that to you again. Many people know and this, this is the confusion. They know they have faith to move mountains, but they don't realize that their lack of moving in the law of love denies them their miracle. Why do you think that the, the enemy works so hard to cause the church to be so judgmental and negative? Mm -hmm. Because he knows if they ever, Jesus said, they'll know you're my disciples because you step on toes. Is that what no, he said? No, not that's he not said. what he said. They'll know you're my disciples because you're picking an abortion clinic. Is that no? Mm -hmm. That's not what he said. I mean, you talk about well, what about the social ills of the day, the the time period that Jesus came up in and the church he established. That that world was much more decadent. There was much more debauchery and vileness at all levels of society in the first century uh, time frame when Jesus walked the earth in the early church. And they were not, listen to me, they were not an activist church. They were not an insurgent church. They understood what Jesus said. They will know you are my disciples by your love one mm -hmm. for another. <laughs> and uh, so uh, again, you, you, it's moving in love. So the lepers return with the good news that the siege is broken and food is brought from the camp and the Lord, the man who worked with the king, who mocked Elisha, he's killed in the stampede. When this man spoke out against Elisha's prediction that the siege would be broken, he was saying what he saw in front of him. He was saying what he saw in front of him. Elisha was speaking the thing desired. Everybody wanted to eat. It's like when Elijah said, uh, the woman's going to have a baby. And she said, don't mock me. Mm -hmm. Says there's something in us. We don't want to believe the good stuff. Pillow prophet. Mm -hmm. Give me somebody that will step on toes. <laughs> mm -hmm. The man mocked. He entered not in because of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 6. Are you ready for your miracle? Are you ready to make a chaos decision? Be bold, not only to believe for big things, but to be willing to see big things happen for your enemies and be determined to make decisions. Understand that what you do after you pray has as much impact as the prayer itself. And many people don't get that. They do not understand corresponding action. You have to do something. And it's not like Smith Wigglesworth. We all talk about Smith Wigglesworth. He gathered 200 pastors together on a Sunday. And he said, if we have any faith, we believe God for healing. I want every pastor in this place to take off your glasses and stomp them. And he took off his glasses too. 
and they stomped their glasses. And that afternoon, 200 pastors were trying to find an ophthalmologist to grind them new glasses because none of them got healed. On a Sunday, probably. <laughs> and it's not about going down to Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and writing a faith check. In Broken That's Arrow, right. Oklahoma, they, they don't call that a faith check. They call that a hot check. <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference, but it is about doing what God said. Mm -hmm. It's like God, here's an example. God told Kitty and I, we were running a business 130 miles from where we live now, and God told us to move to Branson, Missouri. And all in the natural, all that was going to do was create a 130-mile commute. Times two. <laughs> Times Going two. And coming back <laughs> daily. And we did it. And guess what? We were blessed, and it led to a set of... Uh, situations that we could not anticipate what mm -hmm. God was actually doing was setting us up to be catapulted into a worldwide ministry mm -hmm. and to sell that business Amen. but we didn't have those answers in the beginning no, we, we just were just that. doing what God said to do it was a chaos decision it made no sense right <laughs> right and so uh, are you ready to make a chaos decision there are many of you God's called upon you to make it you you prayed and you haven't gotten an answer, and you've been tempted to fall into that theology of, yeah, I know God said he would do stuff, but throw you know, away your prophecy. doesn't mean he's, yeah, you don't want to, you want to despise that prophetic word, but let me mm -hmm. tell you something, what you do, what are you doing? God can deal with anything except your refusal to make a decision. Some of you have been called upon to make decisions, and uh, like, and hey, I know what that's like. I told somebody one time, I said, if that's what God wants me to do, I have to confess I don't have the courage. And it just wasn't his timing for us. You know, and oh my goodness, we got crucified over that yeah. one. I've never, the hottest persecution we've ever received is when I just transparently said, look, I, I, if that's what I'm supposed to do, I don't have courage for it. Yeah. <laughs> and they and they promptly slammed the gate of God. Well, then you're going to, your marriage will be destroyed. Your business will be destroyed. Your whole life's going to be destroyed because I wasn't doing what they said. No, it wasn't. You know, and then promptly all three of those men's lives in the next few years were promptly destroyed. Within a within twenty twenty four months. And we just kept working out like, like yeah. God, here we are. And See, God took us as we as we just kept moving in love, kept doing what he said. We made the, some chaos decisions. We didn't make it on man's timetable. We get right. that a lot. I don't have a problem with what you did, it's just the timing of it. Well, that's okay. You're not my Lord. That's right. Only so Jesus. We're going to do Lord. what the Lord tells us to do, but we love you anyway. <laughs> Come here and give me a big kiss. That's right. <laughs> you know? that's and right. no, you didn't do what we said. <laughs> but God is in charge. But He's God's in charge. in charge. Just keep on loving. Keep on loving. Keep on obeying. It's not just about pray, praying. It's not just about getting the prophetic word. It's about the corresponding Doing action. Something. And listen to me. We'll close with this. Corresponding action. And your response time to God establishes his response time to you. You put it on the shelf and you wait, you create delay. Mm -hmm. And the quality of your response to God determines the quality of his response to you. I don't want a fraction of what God, we give God fraction, a fractional response. We give mm -hmm. God, well, okay, mm -hmm. a little lip service. You know, we make a little bit of an effort and we wonder why we get an anemic answer. No, you need to give God a full and prompt response Amen. because the quality of your response and the timing of your response determines the timing of his response and uh, the quality of his response to you. Be bold. Step out. Mm -hmm. uh, obey God. Even if it seems that, that you've got nothing, why sit we here till we die? And th this doesn't apply to people who don't need change. Is there anything you want changed in your life? Do you want your finances to be different? Do you want your home life to be different? Do you want to move into ministry portion? I went for uh, over 10 years in total isolation with the call of God on my heart. And there came a time I had to make some chaos decisions that cost me everything. It cost me houses. It cost me cars. It cost me my business. And God gave it all back to me. But I walked away from it and we faced homelessness because I made some chaos decisions that we stood by and, and, and we were just desperate. We didn't have any answers. And, and God, would you explain yourself? And he said, no. <laughs> and he said, do you want peace or do you want understanding? You can't have both. And we choose to have chose to have peace and we were catapulted into a place where everything we say and do is as effective as if God said it or did it and we're no God's no respecter of persons if you do what with your faith what we were 
privileged and humbled and just so utterly uh, uh, blessed to do with the little bit of faith God gave us. It'll do the same thing for you, but there must be corresponding action and you must stay sweet in your soul and Amen. keep loving. Amen. Hey, um, so the Lord told me while Russ is preaching that there's some of you that need to take some kind of action. And uh, because, you know, this narrative is driving our life. The word of God is driving our life. So he said the, the siege is over and the abundance has arrived. You guys, we all need to say thank you, God, that we have just stepped into a time of abundance because I prophesy to you that the darkest day is behind you and the prosperity of God has been released and it's on its way to you, but you better know what to do with it. So today, if you can do anything, write on a piece of paper what you would do with, let, let us just, I mean, ask God to give you a figure. If say $100,000 came to you today, write on a tablet according to Habakkuk 2, what you would do with what God gave you. He loves a good manager. He's a good manager. He loves a good manager. Write it down. Make it plain because then you can run. You won't get confused and you won't let anybody try to talk you out of what you're going to do. We have that in our heart and in our home that we plan on doing certain things that God has given us the privilege to do and to believe for. And I believe the time is now. The word of God is consistent with that. Um, there's something else. So one time a prophet said, God is going to bring you multiplied millions of dollars because you, you're you here today, he said, because you've not gone your own way and you've waited on the Lord. And he said, I see $25,000 is coming and it's just the beginning. It's just the first fruits. So I have a deposit slip sitting in my checkbook waiting with $25,000 down on the bottom line waiting for that first fruits to come do something if you don't do anything else do that and ask God and watch God but do something with your faith the angels are looking over our shoulders today saying what are you gonna do what are you gonna do you just gonna keep dreaming or are you gonna take some action so do something with what you have what's Amen. in your wallet what's in your hand what's in your heart and in the name of Jesus I release the abundance of the earth to you from the north and the south the east and the west Russ and I release the silver the gold the precious jewels the pearls of great price to you we release houses and buildings and lands houses and buildings and land and people he said I'll even give you the heathen for your inheritance let the inheritances come now says the Lord in Jesus Christ's name amen